And so uh, with that, we have joining us next, uh, Dr. Dombrowski coming in from, uh, again, uh, just the perspective of someone who's not only a clinician, uh, but also someone who has a, a, an amazing depth around digital health and an international perspective on top of being a digital health expert and being a clinician, uh, as well as understanding the global perspective. So, uh, Wen, thank you very much for joining us today. Great to see you. Thank you, Stan. Thanks for having me. So with that, I'll introduce myself and then I'll hand it over to our panelists as well. So I'm Wen Dombrowski. I'm a physician and a technologist and strategist. And my company Catalyze works with US and global healthcare organizations, technology companies, investors, and nonprofits. And I love hearing about what different people and organizations are doing around the world because there's so much to learn from what, are, what other people are doing. And a lot of it can be translated and applied both locally as well as abroad. So with that, I'd like to first um, invite our panelist, Olivi, to introduce, our, introduce herself. Uh, maybe if you could just share some context about who you are, um, you know, how, how, did you, how did you get to where you are and like what populations you serve? Just give a little bit of context before we dive into what your organization does now. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. And uh, thank you, Wen, for that warm welcome. Uh, so I'm Pallavi and I'm from New Delhi, India. And uh, it's 11 p.m. over here in IST. So apologies if uh, I seem a little worn out. But uh, I'm sure you've all had a very exciting day because uh, I was just listening to the previous panel and relating to a lot of things that were spoken about, especially about um, how we can provide equity and what needs to be done you know, with respect to social determinants. So uh, I graduated from dental school, so I'm trained to be a dental surgeon, but I moved into the health tech space right out of dental school. And I've previously worked with a Y Combinator startup as a digital marketing mm -hmm. manager. And then I decided to join um, DigiSwast Foundation, which is essentially a nonprofit organization. What we're doing is that we're serving the populations which reside in the remotest parts of India. So these are rural communities and they are mostly, you know, the folks who don't have any kind of access to healthcare. They lack the healthcare awareness and we're trying to change that. We're trying to make things more accessible and affordable for them through uh, physical telemedicine centers, which is a different concept here in India. So, you know, uh, mostly when you think about telemedicine, you think about connecting online, connecting virtually, but here we have a hybrid model so there is somebody at the centers guiding you, guiding the patients and helping them facilitate these consultations. Great. So I just also wanna welcome Fran. I'm gonna ask the same question to Fran but before we dive deep into what your organization does. If you could tell the audience a little bit about your background of how you got to what you're doing now and also what um, you know, populations or geographies you work with. Thank you. Sure, happy to. So hi everybody, I'm Fran Ayala Somiagela. I'm the uh, head, global head of digital health strategies at HP, uh, as well as a volunteer president of, of REACH, which is a 501c3 global social impact organization. And in both capacities, uh, you know, work uh, across a variety of areas within healthcare, really trying to focus in on addressing some of the persistent challenges that we have in industry, and in particular, um, with the global expansion of application of technology, ensuring for digital health equity. My background over 25 years in industry as an epidemiologist and public health professional, formerly worked for the World Health Organization, as well as CDC and many other institutions. And my practice has taken me to the far reaches of areas, which included uh, Tamil Nadu, uh, India, um, which is um, some of the areas that were just previously described by the other panelists, as well as working with tribal um, and Aboriginal communities around the world. So excited to be on the panel today. Wonderful. So Pallavi, if you could tell us more about your foundation, I know it's a young organization, but you've already made so much impact. Um, you know, tell us how you started it and what you've done so far. Sure, I'd be happy to share that. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, it would be, uh, 
to pompous of me to say that I have been there from the start. So let me break down the story for everyone over here. The foundation, the organization is started by Mr. Sandeep Kumar, who is a childhood cancer survivor. And he was diagnosed with Ewing sarcoma at the age of maybe 11 or 12. Uh, he belongs to this rural district in Uttar Pradesh, uh, which is a state in India. And he had to run around for about six months to just get the proper diagnosis. So when he was unable to receive a proper diagnosis um, after running around for six months, uh, you know, naturally his family went through a lot of turmoil and the people around him too. He lived with other cancer survivors and saw the treatment procedure. You know, he understood the uh, what the healthcare scenario is. And he realized that uh, even after five years of working in Mumbai, when he came back to his uh, village, when he came back to this rural district, he saw that the condition was still the same. People were still unaware about, um, you know, very common healthcare issues, and they were not seeking treatment for it. In fact, they did not even have access for it. So something as simple as a diagnosis, which for uh, urban India is perhaps five clicks away, was five months away for somebody who's residing in these rural areas. So that's when he decided to come up with the Swast Foundation. And we have been operating for about 15 months now. Um, however, we were registered as an organization, as a nonprofit uh, just this year. And the reason why it has been able to create the impact that it has is because we involve a lot of our um, local communities, the stakeholders, and engaging in conversations with them, with these people that we're working for, has helped us really progress, um, you know, multifold. So if there were somebody to come into this narrative from the urban areas, uh, they would not have the gateway, so to say, but because this has been started by somebody who is from the villages, who understands the grassroots, who understands uh, what it's like, you know, the last mile delivery of healthcare services, that's why it has been able to create the impact that it has. So a lot of uh, rapo building and, uh, you know, there have been a lot of workshops, a lot of behavior modification programs that have been put in place to establish this trust and it has been developed over months very gradually and uh, it's not something that can be done overnight especially in a population that uh, does not believe in modern science so uh, coming to the tech aspects of what the um, organization does so like i mentioned that there is a physical center where the patient walks in and we have somebody called the patient navigator who acts as uh, the middleman between the doctor and the patient. So what the person does is that they use digital tools like um, you know, a digital weighing machine or a digital uh, oximeter and they measure all these vital signs of the patients. After recording that, they connect the patient to the doctor through a teleconsultation platform and this software is also where the electronic medical record is generated. Um, once this is generated, it's stored in a safe you know, cloud network and it's accessible to all the doctors who are looking into the case. So the concept of EMR is relatively new in India. Um, over here, even in the urban areas, people don't really have records. So it's, uh, you know, it's too much for us to ask uh, people in the villages to have that. And uh, these are people who don't care much about it necessarily. So they often end up losing the records or, you know, they'll say that I don't know where my file is. I don't know what drugs I'm on. I don't know what I've been diagnosed with. That's the level of, um, or rather lack of healthcare awareness that's still prevalent in the villages. So to make things easier for them, we put it in a language that they understand and I'll speak more about this later uh, when we talk about the challenges that we'll be facing in these areas. Um, all of the consultations take place in a language that the patient understands. So because the patient navigator is somebody from the community, they're able to converse and they're able to translate for the doctor as well as for the patient. Post the consultation, which again, like I mentioned, happens over a video call. When there is a network issue, it happens over an audio call. 
um, the patient is provided with a prescription. And this is again, a digital prescription, which we print for them. We facilitate the, um, you know, what happens next, what happens after the diagnosis. So often these people don't know what to do and guidance, a referral pathway, a network is very important. So we lead them either to a pharmacy or a lab or a hospital in case they need to go ahead for you know further treatment. Um, we try to solve the cases that we get on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are maybe general consults or uh, screening for let's say cancer patients, uh, COVID-19 cases. However, we don't accept cases which come in as an emergency because our centers are not equipped to handle that yet. So uh, that is something that we have to refer to a hospital. And we're, too, we're happy to you know, make that uh, connection. So uh, yeah, once the patient reaches uh, this, you know, uh, after the diagnosis, once they reach the hospital or the lab or the pharmacy, we also invite them to come back for a follow-up which uh, in this case is quite important. And about, uh, as of now, um, just today I you know, asked for the statistics and uh, it turns out only 20% of our patients come back for a follow-up. So that's something that we still need to work upon. Great, thank you, Pallavi. It's, it's really exciting that you're working closely with the community to understand their needs and you know, what their unique challenges are. And then you're combining that with telemedicine. So, you know, you have a rural area combining it with a with modern telemedicine, access to some of the top hospitals and doctors. And and I really like how, you know, before I, I was reading your website about digital. So it's the physical plus the digital. And now I'd like to turn it over to Fran and invite Fran to share about, you know, ways you've used technology with your organizations and, um, you know, talk about some of the implementations or some of the initiatives you've done in different regions. Sure, absolutely. So first thing I'm going to do is I kind of want to break this into three parts, because what you heard Palavi begin to, to describe is what is essentially an approach to addressing what are known as deserts, right? Medical deserts, places in which there's there may not be access to generalists and, and quite, and no doubt, you know, no access to specialists, right? A great example of this is in the creation of what are known as e-birthing centers, uh, where you have remote places in which um, you need to have access to a provider for uh, labor and delivery or complications during pregnancy. The other is in, in stroke, um, stroke centers and having remote access. But what we're beginning to do today beyond the simple use of, of uh, basic telemedicine technology is to leverage things like virtual reality, VR uh, and, and augmented reality um, to help in those types of scenarios. So you're actually able to bring in specialists from, um, from afar to be alongside the uh, lower skill worker in those environments to help them to address challenges. The other thing I'd like to talk a little bit about are examples when it comes to uh, scenarios such as diagnoses. So another great example is in um, dealing with um, screenings for macular degeneration, as an example, right, where you begin to lose your field of, of vision. And the idea that technologies such as VR uh, technology, utilizing the headsets and infrared uh, light can be utilized to help to scan the eye and, and to detect for backward duration as well as for other um, conditions just by doing analysis of the iris. So that's another powerful way in which technology can be used. But I wanna pause for a moment because we are talking about um, you know, more global environments and we're referring to in many respects, um, more uh, lower as well as mid um, sort of mid income level um, societies, if you will. And so when we look at that, when we look at developing and emerging markets, then there's sort of this, this shift, right? We sort of shift away from um, the, the higher prevalences of chronic disease, although we see those elevating, but we begin to uh, acknowledge that things like infectious control are a real area where there's still a significant amount of need. So how do you take community healthcare workers, community educators, or uh, what are known as promotoras in um, Latin regions or known as Ashwa workers in, in Southeast Asia and India. How do you equip those individuals with the technology that they need to be able to go into uh, areas that are either war and torn areas or areas where it, the terrain is, uh, is, is so challenging that you can only get to on foot? 
This is where we've been utilizing technology to create for hybrid models, where you essentially have access, localized access to information that's available, and then periodically begin to provide access to, to further information over time as they travel throughout areas within their region or within their uh, the villages or, 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 or tribes. And so these are some of the ways in which we're using a technology. But I also want to acknowledge uh, the need uh, for upskilling the lower skilled workers. Because the reality is, is that around the world, there's a shortage in workforce uh, when it comes to the medical profession, both amongst specialists, physicians, as well as nurses, significant amount of shortages are occurring. And in some markets, for example, um, in Pakistan, where it's very common that women will pursue an education in medicine, and then ultimately for a significant amount of time, doesn't actually practice because of her because of shift in priorities with family. And so being able to accommodate for those demands by still allowing for them to stay uh, up to, up to uh, par with their, their skill sets, as well as to be able to deliver care in communities where commu uh, care is needed, is another example where groups like HP, along with partners such as uh, MetRed and many others, MetRed Academy, are utilizing technology to actually train up individuals. We're also finding very similar uh, benefits when we're applying virtual reality technology, as we know that um, we're actually able to take the a lecture time, right? Even the standard lecture time, be able to reduce that, uh, what is standardly a 15, 50 minute lecture all the way down to as low as 15 minutes of lecture time and yet having increased comprehension and retention of information. And when actually being um, called upon to perform, clinicians are performing a lot better. So we're really excited about these areas of diagnosis as well as treatment and as equally as training and education for clinicians. Wonderful, Fran, thank you for that. So I see on the clock, we just have a few more minutes left. So I'm gonna ask this as a closing question, if you could just um, briefly summarize what, um, when you think about technology in the, in the use of the different low resource settings that your organization works with, what are some challenges, opportunities, or your hopes for the future? Either one of you can go. Alvi? Okay, sure, sure, I'll go first. <laughs> so uh, like I was mentioning in the previous you know, answer that a very big challenge is the communication barrier that we face. Uh, not just in terms of language, but also in terms of understanding. So a lot of our patients uh, about, uh, you know, the majority of them, let's say 80% of the patients that we do have, they haven't received higher education. So their, uh, you know, level of understanding of how important healthcare is, is uh, relatively low when you compare it to someone who has been born and brought up in an urban setting. And this is also the reason why they prefer going to an unregistered medical practitioner, which are called quacks, and they have faith in them. They have faith in the traditional practices, which are often more harmful than good. So uh, shifting you know, their perspective and changing uh, the way they interact with medical professionals has uh, also been quite a challenge. Not just that, we also have uh, somebody asked in the uh, Q&A that is DigiSwas providing pro bono consultations. Yes, uh, our services are pro bono. Uh, it depends on the doctors. We have about 80 plus doctors on board. So it depends on the healthcare professional, how much they want to charge. Some of them pro uh, offer pro bono consultations, whereas some of them uh, offer consultations at a subsidized rate, which comes down to about, uh, one US dollar, so about 100 bucks or so in uh, INR. And um, the other segment, apart from telemedicine, is the healthcare awareness. And these webinars are offered uh, pro bono. So we go to the communities that are door-to-door -door campaigns. We distribute awareness materials. And um, yeah, that is the part where we're trying to increase healthcare awareness. Uh, I would love to, you know, uh, give the mic to Fran in the interest of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I would say that um, it's really important that we point out that what Pallavi is really speaking to is a universal problem. Health literacy and now digital health literacy are universal problems. 
they're not just specific to uh, in, you know one area or region of the globe. And so for us, our real hope is, is that we're able to make sure that all people everywhere have access to technology and that they know how to utilize that technology. Let me briefly explain why this is so important. When it comes to clinicians, as an example, their willingness to actually deploy the technology within their practices is very key. If they don't deploy it, if it's not made available to them, that creates for challenges. Equally so, if individuals, while we know that digital technology can be utilized to promote self-care, if they're not educated around the importance of it or how to utilize it, and even more importantly, ensure that everyone has access to it, then we still are gonna be faced with lots of challenges. The reality is, is that the 20 to 30 percent of individuals who need access the most, uh, need, need care the most, are the ones who have access the least. So how do we make sure that we are creating for accommodating for the needs of these individuals? And these individuals are not just based on, um, you know, on social or, or economic status. It can also be based on mental as well as physical circumstances. We must also be sure to take into account the largest uh, the largest minority globally, which is a disabled community, over a billion disabled individuals around the world. So making sure that when we are designing technology, we're designing in ways that are universal uh, is really uh, very, uh, very critical. So I just wanted to, you know, um, point those things out. It worries me that when we look at um, clinician buy-in to use of things like data science um, and use of AI, that the adoption rates are not where we want for them to be. This not only requires for legislative changes, it also requires that there be more education given to clinicians. One of the big pushbacks that we have heard from the pandemic, uh, in the throes of the pandemic, while there was an increased use of technology, increased use of telemedicine, there were many who complained that they were not given uh, adequate training and support from the institutions who were demanding and insisting upon them utilizing the technology. So moving forward, these are the things that we want to put an emphasis on. Uh, our, we have a humanitarian goal at HP to touch over 150 million lives uh, with technology with an emphasis on women, uh, disabled communities, and individuals of socially economic depressed environments and communities. So um, I'm just hopeful that everyone will join us in that journey. And I applaud um, Pallavi as well as Gwen for the amazing work that they are also doing within this field. Thank you, Fran. <laughs> I, it's been amazing to hear about what Fran and Pallavi are doing. And I wish we had several hours because I know they both have a lot of rich insights and this conversation can continue. Um, I would like to also thank all the attendees for tuning in. Um, feel free to keep in touch with us. I will post our links again in the chat. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Wen. And thank you, Debbie. Thank you, everyone. No, a really, really wonderful conversation there, guys. I, like I, like uh, Wen said, uh, I do wish there was definitely more time uh, to, to hear what you guys have to say. Uh, you definitely had a lot of insight to share um, and uh, you know everybody uh, attending please do catch up and connect with uh, Fran and Pallaby and Wen uh, to carry on the conversation uh, after after we wrap up here so thank you guys very much uh, for, for sharing your insights. So just before we wrap up I just want to uh, let everybody know about the upcoming events that HitLab has got as we close out the year uh, a couple of different uh, uh, events that I think everybody uh, is excited about. We have our Women's Health Tech Wednesday uh, in our current series of uh, season two of Women's Health Tech Wednesday, uh, hosting Meg Columbia Walsh, uh, the global marketing leader uh, of healthcare services from uh, the Amazon Web Services. Uh, she'll be uh, talking with our host, Nina Joshi, uh, on October 27th at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, and keeping in the same vein of uh, the Women's Health Tech Initiative, we are still accepting applications for the Women's Health Tech Challenge, uh, which is going to be uh, happening on December, sorry, December 17th, uh, at one o'clock Eastern Standard Time. Uh, but do please get your uh, applications uh, to us as quickly as possible as the deadline is tomorrow. So uh, good luck to everybody applying and please do share it with any other uh, innovators and entrepreneurs who are in the femtech space. Uh, moving across to the Columbia Business School, uh, which is where Stan is right now. That's why he can't be here to close it all up. Um, but we have 
the two digital health strategy cohorts running uh, in November. We have managing digital therapeutics uh, approvals uh, running from November 9th to November 18th. And in December, to close the year off, we have health data science um, running from the 7th of December to the 16th. So please get in touch with HitLab, um, either at media.hitlab.org or events at hitlab.org. If you want to hear more about the, Colum the Columbia Business School uh, Digital Health Strategy uh, cohorts. Uh, the last uh, but not least uh, HitLab event that closes out the rest of the year is the HitLab Innovator Summit. Um, it's our biggest uh, hallmark event of the year, and we do hope you all join us there for an exciting um, insight to the economics of digital health in the new normal. Uh, that's going to run from November 30th to December 2nd. Uh, again, all the links for these wonderful events are in the chat, uh, so please do check them out and do uh, find out more on hitlab.org. And lastly, uh, as Stan mentioned, FTI Consulting is hosting a roundtable, an exclusive roundtable at that, uh, and a discussion uh, between uh, digital research and development, medical and pharma executives happening on October 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you are interested, again, please email events at hitlab.org or media at hitlab.org as well, if you are interested in participating. Uh, we'd like to, of course, thank our generous sponsors without whom None of this would be possible. So we do want to thank the folks at Aperture, Metadata, Remember Stuff, Live Care, Medocity, Curio, Health X Solutions, and of course, Goodwin. Uh, so please do check them out. I think some of the links are in the chat for these wonderful organizations as well. And of course, we'd like to thank you, the viewers, uh, for coming on and joining uh, the, uh, the wonderful symposium uh, on digital health and human rights. So it just leaves me to say, uh, Good morning, if you are still in the morning time, good afternoon, good evening, and good night.